Good morning. The record will reflect the presence of counsel, the defendant, and the jury. Mr. Barker, you may call your next witness. Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? This you do under the penalty of perjury? Good morning. I was going to ask if you didn't mind doing that. Thank you. Mr. Barker, you may proceed when ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Go ahead and take a drink there. Thank you. Can you state your name, please? <clears throat> Michael Madsen. Where do you work? I am the assistant medical examiner for the Coconino County Medical Examiner's Office. Okay. And how long have you worked there? I have been uh, at the Coconino County Medical Examiner's Office for about four years. And prior to that, where did you work? Uh, before that, I was at the Midwest Medical Examiner's Office, which was located in Ramsey, Minnesota, which is a, a suburb of Minneapolis, St. Paul. And I worked there for seven years. In the same capacity? Yes. Okay. And uh, let's talk about your education a little bit. How did you become a medical examiner? Uh, I guess going back, I originally I got my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from the University of North Dakota. Uh, I did a uh, master's degree in biomechanics at Indiana University and then I went to medical school at the University of Chicago. Following that I did a, a anatomic and clinical pathology residency at the University of Vermont and then a forensic pathology fellowship at uh, Hennepin County uh, Medical Examiner's Office in Minneapolis, Minnesota. What is forensic pathology? Uh, I guess to uh, start um, uh, pathology is a, it is a, a area of specialization in, in medicine. Uh, it's kind of the laboratory side of medicine. So in order to become a forensic pathologist, you um, do specialty training in pathology. Again, it's basically the study of disease. Um, within the field of pathology, there's uh, what's called anatomic and clinical pathology. So anatomic pathology is, uh, deals a lot with like the diagnosis, um, looking at tissue and diagnosing disease. So if anybody's ever had a surgery or knows somebody had a surgery where any tissue was removed, it was sent to the pathology lab. And a pathologist would look at it and try to aid the clinician with diagnosing and, and, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, clinical side of pathology deals with, you know, the kind of the laboratory medicine. So if anyone's ever had their blood drawn, it goes to the laboratory, a pathologist kind of oversees the lab. Uh, Autopsy pathology is is kind of is a essentially a, a branch of that. Um, so, following all that training of medical school and pathology training, uh, I did a forensic pathology fellowship. And forensic pathology then is essentially a branch of medicine that um, takes all that training and knowledge of disease, but also knowledge of injuries and how um, basically to investigate uh, death and determine cause of death, essentially how people are dying. So the knowledge of medicine and injuries to, to determine the cause of death. All right, thank you. Uh, so you're a doctor, is that right? Correct. Okay. And uh, you're a medical examiner or the assistant medical examiner for Coconino County. What does that mean? What do you do? Uh, essentially, the, I think the, the best way to think of the medical examiner's office is that um, Anytime someone dies within Coconino County, that the death is sudden, unexpected, it's outside of the hospital. Um, if it's any sort of violent death or traumatic death, we're going to become involved and we're going to do what we call a death investigation, um, where we are trying to determine, kind of, again, the cause of death. How did, the, how did this person die? do an investigation in terms of the circumstances of surrounding this death. And as the medical examiner, um, you know, there's multiple people that work within the medical examiner's office. As the medical examiner, 
we're the ones that are kind of overseeing this whole in, in um, the entire investigation. You know, if an autopsy needs performed, we're the ones that are performing the autopsy. And at the end of the entire investigation, I'll make a determination as to the, the cause and manner of death. So the cause and manner of death, uh, the cause would be how that person died. Is that the mechanics of that? Is that right? Yeah, essentially, the, the definition of, a, of the cause of death is either the, the natural disease process or the injury or some sort of combination of natural disease and injury that initiated the chain of events that led to the person's death. So essentially, yeah, what, what led this person to die. Manner of death is... Um, our attempt um, on the death certificate to try to uh, summarize the circumstances around around death. Um, do you want me to go into that any sure. more? Essentially, in the state of Arizona, we have five options for the manner of death: um, natural, natural death. So the death, the person is dying completely from natural disease processes, um, an accident. So again, some. Um, unintentional, unforeseen act it, that causes an injury that leads to the person's death. Um, suicide, where a person intentionally causes some sort of injury that leads to their death. Uh, homicide, where um, another person, or another individual, causes the injuries that leads to a person's death. And then the fifth one is undetermined, where following a complete investigation, there's just not enough information to put it in one of those other categories. All right. So manner and cause of death are, are your conclusions at the end of an investigation, right? Correct. Uh, but you're not, you're not deciding who, if someone was involved in the homicide, you're not deciding identity. That's not part of that conclusion. Is that right? Yeah. The, as far as the, that, yeah, that's out of the realm of our, our jurisdiction. All right. So uh, you talked about autopsy. What, can you just describe what an autopsy is and what you're doing? Yes. Um, so essentially, the, an autopsy is a, a, uh, a medical examin a examination of a person who has died. Um, just basically, we, we kind of think of it in, in two, two steps. The first part is the external examination, where, again, I'm going to examine the outside of the, uh, of, of the deceased person's body. Um, Again, we'll examine the clothing. Um, we'll, re you know, we kind of do this stepwise. We'll remove the clothing. Um, we might be looking, you know, documenting any medical intervention that might be there, looking for any sort of trace evidence that might need to be collected in certain situations, uh, looking for identifying characteristics, signs of natural disease, signs of injuries, and documenting this. Some situations we might do additional testing during the external examination, such as x-rays and things like that. Um, after the external examination is done, then we'll make a series of surgical incisions to look inside the body. Again, we'll examine all the, the organs of the body, looking for, again, signs of um, natural disease, signs of injuries, and documenting those. We'll collect specimens like blood um, to do toxicology testing. Um, so again, that's... Uh, again, looking for signs of uh, injury and, and, uh, and disease. So what you described there, examining the body, doing the autopsy, that's happening at your office, is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, do you also go out to scenes where the bodies are located? Uh, myself, uh, on some occasions I do, but we, again, I'd mentioned earlier that there's multiple people that work for our office. One of the positions that we have are called death investigators. So we have uh, a certain number of people who their, one of their primary functions is to go to the, again, if a person dies out, um, dies, you know, outside of the medical setting and, you know, in their home or outside somewhere, uh, we'll become notified of that and, our death investigator will go to the scene and perform uh, an investigation. And part of that is to examine the scene, examine the, the body at the scene. Um, on some occasions, uh, I, I will go to assist the death investigator. And then do they bring the body to your office? Is that how that works? Correct, yeah. After the scene investigation is completed, the body will be um, brought back to our office for, again, for the, the autopsy that would follow. How is the body uh, transported? 
uh, we will, the, the death investigator will um, place the, the body in a body bag, and then at the scene, the investigator will seal the body bag so that, again, for kind of chain of custody, so that when I um, perform the autopsy, when, we, when I get in there, the, that body bag is sealed, I know that nobody has um, opened the bag and done anything to the body from the time that it left the scene until the autopsy. All right. Uh, doctor, did you perform an autopsy and examination on the body of Sasha Krauss? Yes. All right, let's talk about that. How, how did you become aware of, of uh, her death? How were you notified? Yeah, again, um, when her body was discovered, again, law enforcement was contacted, and once they declared her dead, they contacted our office. So uh, we became aware of that uh, through being contacted by law enforcement that they needed uh, one of our investigators to uh, go to the scene, and that's then I I was aware of it through our investigator who was in I was in contact with through that through her scene investigation. And uh, then I assume, like you told us before, then the body was transported to your office. Is that right? Correct. Um, and then how soon after that transport was the examination? Uh, the, the transport was on a, a Friday, like Friday evening, Friday night. So the autopsy occurred on Monday morning. So there was, you know, Saturday and Sunday before the, the autopsy occurred. And is that fairly common to wait a couple of days? For our, yes, for our office, the, given the, the size of our office, we typically do not perform autopsies on the weekend. So if somebody, uh, if, a, if a person dies and the body comes to our office on a Friday like this, it wouldn't, uh, autopsy wouldn't be performed um, till the following week. Now a body, when it's left out in, let's say room temperature, would decompose over time, is that right? Yeah, as, as soon as a as soon as a person dies, there's decomposition processes that that start and continue on. Um, so there there are things that can be done to slow that that decomposition process. One of the things that we do at the medical examiner's office is we've got to we store the bodies in a in a cooler that that's cooler temperatures essentially can slow the the decomposition process so that it you really um, aren't going to notice any differences from had we done the, the autopsy a day or two earlier. How, how cool are these bodies kept? Uh, I think ours is set at like 38, 38 degrees. Um, so it's, it's, you want it to be uh, a little bit, you don't want it to be fro you know, freezing, but you want it to be as close to that without um, causing any other artifacts to the body. All right. Um, so that Monday, then you examined Sasha's body. Let's take it step by step. Uh, what was the first thing that you did? Again, that we you know, again once we break that seal and open up the body bag, we photograph and document the the body as we're receiving it in the in the autopsy suite. Uh, you know, so she still had clothing on. Um, essentially, as she was found you know she we examined her as she was essentially found so uh, the initial part of the examination is just again looking at uh, looking at that document of the clothing um, given the the, the sus suspicious circumstances under which she was found uh, we did collect um, some do some trace evidence and evidence collection um, including your clothing uh, there was her, hand, her wrists were bound with duct tape, so we collected that and some other trace evidence. So let's uh, let's just be clear about what she, how she appeared when you received the body. Um, you mentioned duct tape, and how was that duct tape uh, on her body? Again, so her arms and hands were in uh, in front of her body, and they were there was duct tape that was kind of wrapped around the the hands, kind of wrap, holding them together. All right, and did you remove that duct tape, or did someone assist you in doing that? There was, yeah, we, there was a, a gentleman from the uh, Arizona Department of Public Safety. There, was, there were multiple people uh, 
that were present in the autopsy, and one of them was a, a gentleman who assisted, and he removed uh, the duct tape and, and to do that in a, a fashion that the, the crime lab would, would prefer. All right. So he just he wanted to take care so that he couldn't, or so he could examine that later. Yes. Uh, you mentioned other people. These were law enforcement folks as well in the autopsy room. Yes, there were uh, multiple representatives from from law enforcement, um, and we there were. Uh, I think there was a representative from the county attorney's office, and uh, rep, uh, we had there were two uh, nurses from the. Uh, that do uh, sexual examination uh, nurses. Okay, so you talked about the duct tape. There was also clothing you mentioned. Can you describe that clothing? Yeah, she was wearing a uh, like a, a gray dress, uh, white uh, sweatshirt with a hooded sweatshirt, uh, a pair of black, black black shoes and black socks. All right. Did uh, she have anything on her head? Yes, she. Her head was. Um, her hair was kind of fashioned in this bun with, uh, and there was some clips in uh, like a mesh uh, type of thing to, to hold her this bun in place. Okay. What about uh, any undergarments? She did not have. Uh, well, she had a, a bra, um, but I don't. I, yeah, she did not have underwear on. All right. Uh, anything else? Any other clothing items that we didn't discuss? Uh, I can't recall. I would have to have looked at my autopsy report to um, that would do that would document all that was on there. So, all right. Um, and you mentioned photos. So you're taking photos as you're removing these items and documenting them. Is that right? Correct. One of my one of my assistants is we're working together and she was taking the photographs. And you, you've also mentioned trace evidence. What do you mean by that? Uh, so sometimes, again, in, in certain situations, we'll do uh, collect various items where there could be, uh, that could be of, of importance from a, an evidentiary standpoint. So sometimes we'll, we'll take uh, clippings of the fingernails, uh, just in case there might be DNA under, uh, under the fingernails. Uh, in some situations, we'll, we'll do swabs of various surfaces of the body, again, looking for, uh, again, to send to the crime lab. They can analyze these for DNA and those sorts of things. Um, in this situation, there, was, uh, there were a, a few hairs that we collected, again, not knowing, not necessarily knowing what they were, um, but saving them for possible analysis that might be needed late at, at some point down the road. And that's important what you just said, Doctor, I want to follow up on that. You, you don't know all the time what you're collecting, if it's going to be of value, is that right? Correct. And so you're being conservative and just trying to collect anything that could have evidentiary value? Correct. Um, after removing the clothing items, um, did you notice any injuries to the body? Yes. Um, again, once once we removed the clothing and we're able to do a more thorough examination, um, she did. Ha she had some kind of scattered bruises on her and, and abrasions on you know her arms, her legs, uh, but she. Again, when, when looking, uh, one of the things that we do is when, you know, we're going to, she had, you know, she had quite a bit of hair, but we're going to look carefully to see if there's injury, any injuries to the scalp. And um, pretty early on, we could tell she had a, an injury to, to her head. Um, so, again, in that initial part of the examination, we could see some injuries. Let's get, uh, let's go back to uh, the body. We'll talk about the head in a minute, but anything you mentioned, it's kind of scattered bruising, but anything that stood out to you as uh, potentially a cause of death? Uh, as far as the, the injuries to her, yeah, to their extremities, to her, her chest, back, and that sort of thing, there is no obvious lethal injury to, to those parts of her body. All right. 
Um, was her body in a state of decomposition when you received it? Yes, there were, um, again, like I'd mentioned earlier, as soon as a person passes, you know, as soon as a person dies, um, our body's normal processes have, have ended. The body's going to start um, the process of decomposition. And the rate that that ha happens can, can vary quite a bit. There's several factors that play a role in that. Um, so uh, there's certain things that 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 happen um, again after a person dies and the heart's no longer beating and pushing blood all through the blood vessels the blood kind of can settle just with gravity however the person's lying uh, the muscles can tighten up um, after again after a person dies and then as time goes on there can be more um, again there's bacteria that's always living within our body and as Time goes on; those bacteria can start to cause more dramatic changes um, to the body, and she she had some some changes, some discoloration and 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 whatnot. But it was on the the milder side of what we see, what we can see in in terms of decomposition changes. Okay. Uh, let's go to the head. Then you mentioned some obvious injuries to her head. Describe those. So she had um, kind of on the the right side of her head kind of near the top but kind of a little bit to the right uh, there was about a, a two inch laceration which laceration is kind of the um, you know it's kind of a fancy term for a blunt uh, a tearing of the skin due to a blunt force some sort of you know object or the head hitting an object or an object hitting the head so the skin kind of tore in that area that was the most obvious injury um, that we could see uh, initially, um, during the examination of the of her clothing, we noticed in the hood of the sweatshirt there was a small defect and it had a little bit of gray discoloration around it. Um, so that, uh, for us, we it raised the possibility of could there be a gunshot wound. So, before we went too much really any further, we, we did a, an, I'd mentioned earlier that sometimes we'll do a, additional um, studies such as x-rays. So we did an x-ray to look to see if there was any signs of, um, that there had been a gunshot wound. And, and on the x-ray, we did see that there was, a, uh, there was a bullet and some small fragments of a bullet in, within the head. All right, let me go back to the blunt force injury. You talked about that laceration on the head. Uh, an injury like that, would that bleed a lot? They often, yeah, it, um, the, the scalp has quite a few blood vessels, so if a person has a laceration, that can cause quite a bit of, it can be known to cause quite a bit of bleeding. In, in this case, though, was there anything preventing blood from getting all over the clothing that she's wearing? Yeah, the, I, I had mentioned earlier, you know, she had uh, quite a, um, you know, each, uh, is the, the best way to explain this is that, you know, there's, um, each situation can be a little bit different. So sometimes we will have people that have a similar type of laceration. And there's a lot of um, bleeding around. Uh, in this situation, there wasn't a, a, a lot of obvious blood around there. But a, again, a, a part of that, and it's, it's, we can have the same situation too with gunshot wounds of the head. Um, but she had, again, a lot of hair um, and it was again when it was organized in this bun um, again that was one of the things in the, in the initial part of the examination you could not see the the gunshot wound in his head that we'll talk about later again because of the amount of hair and how her hair was arranged so the hair was kind of preventing the blood from spreading everywhere is that what I understand it that's certainly a possibility it's it's it, uh, again, because you kind of had to uh, manipulate the hair to be able to see these injuries. You described it as being in a bond, so and tied together or not tied together, but uh, pinned together as well. Is, is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, so that was a blunt force injury. Anything about that injury that tells you what type of object was being used? Uh, so we. Um, a lot of times we'll, 
we dis, as, you know, forensic pathologists, medical examiners will describe injuries as being um, patterned or non-patterned. Um, a patterned injury uh, will have features that you can, you know, additional features that might be able to allow you to make some sort of assessment as to what object, you know, there, there's some sort of pattern that allows you to say this type of object is causing this injury. Um, most of the time with blunt force injuries, uh, most of the time they're going to be what we call non-pattern that uh, I can tell from this injury that it, is a, it, it was, you know, had features that make it, that make me say this is a blunt force injury, that some blunt, some object um, interacted with her head. Uh, but it's not, it was non-specific in the sense of I, I, I really can't say definitively what type of object or, you know, what exact object it would have been. When we say blunt force, that would be as opposed to like a sharp object, is that right? Yeah, so a blunt force injury, again, is that that interaction is the force is tearing the, the skin apart versus like a sharp force injury where uh, there's basically a, a, some object like such as a knife that has a sharp, sharp edge and cuts through the skin. All right, so a blunt force object could be anything like a rock, a hammer, the butt of a gun, anything like that. Sure, yes. Right. Maybe a fist even? Yes. Okay. Um, before I move on from that, we were talking about the blood again kind of being captured in the hair. Um, does gravity have any, does that play a part in wh whether the blood's going to gush out or anything like that? Uh, it, gravity certainly can have a, a play a, a role in, in the sense of how the blood, if if the blood is you know, kind of oozing out of the, the wound after a person dies and continuing to kind of flow out from the wound, it's going to, you know, kind of flow with, with gravity. So, uh, you know, that, that certainly can play a role. Um, you mentioned when the heart stops beating, the blood stops circulating throughout the body. Uh, if someone's deceased, is that blood going to be spurting out of a, a wound like that? No, once again, once the once the heart has stopped um, beating, and there's no longer blood pressure in in the uh, you know forcing blood through the the vasculature through the blood vessels, it really shouldn't. But you know you do have um, you know I'd mentioned you do still you know have blood within the blood vessels. So if there's injuries to those blood vessels and they're they're torn apart, blood can still kind of leak out and flow out. It's just not being pushed out. So, it, um, so it, it's not uncommon for a person if they have injuries such as a, a laceration or a gunshot in the head to have quite a bit of blood to kind of ooze out even after their heart has stopped um, beating. Uh, again, just because especially in situations like where if that wound is in an area where just blood would be kind of flowing to that area, just be through the effects of gravity. All right. So we're talking about the difference between kind of pressurized uh, as opposed to just oozing or leaking out. Could you tell with this injury, the blunt force injury, whether she was alive at the time that injury was caused? Yes. So the we we at autopsy. Um, we look for signs that we, we uh, of what we call a vital reaction. Again, that the heart was was beating, that they were alive at the time the injury occurred. Um, again, if if you have a a blunt a blunt force injury that tears the skin and tears the blood vessels, and the heart is beating, those blood vessels that are torn, the you know the the blood pressure is going to be kind of keep forcing blood out into the tissues um, around the area that was torn. So we again we look for bleeding around these injuries, um, in the in the soft tissues and that sort of thing. And when looking at this laceration on on her side of her head, there was bleeding and bruising in the soft tissues around there. So uh, again, these are consistent with her being alive, her the, the heart pumping and um, beating at the time that the injury happened, as compared to um, if a person. Heart's not beating. They've got no blood pressure in their their um, blood vessels, and there's some sort of injury that 
tears those blood vessels open, you really shouldn't see much of any of that type of uh, injury. And the, those injuries will, again, they don't have that vital reaction. They'll be more of a, a yellow-orange color, that, that sort of thing. Can you tell, based on the amount of blood, how long she was alive uh, after that injury occurred? No, the, um, it's really, again, the, the, the injuries were acute in the sense that um, there was no signs of any sort of healing. You know, these happened relatively within the time frame, a, 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 an acute time frame from when she died, but um, not able to give any sort of uh, precise uh, assessment as far as how exactly how long before the heart stopped beating that this injury had occurred. Uh, you say acute. I mean, is this minutes, hours? What, what can you say about it? It could be. It could be minutes. It could be hours. But it wouldn't be like, you know, a day or you know, it wouldn't wouldn't be getting into that. You know, twelve. You know, a day or two days or anything like that. What about seconds? It certainly could be. Um, it's not impossible. It could be. You know, a short period of time, you know, seconds and that sort of thing. All right. Uh, one other question on the blunt force trauma. The, uh, can you say anything about how many strikes? Was it one strike, multiple strikes to the head? Again, there was, uh, there's at least one. Um, we can definitely say that. And again, there was the, this laceration on the side of the head. Uh, it was a fairly, again, it was a, about two inches long, and it was fairly deep, you know, almost going down to the, <clears throat> the surface of the skull. So, you know, it's one of the possibilities is could there be a, another impact that is essentially kind of perfectly placed that is within the same part of the tissues that are torn open and, and not causing another injury to the skin. So it's theoretically possible there could have been a you know, more impacts that just kind of were within the depths of the wound, but um, definitively at least one. All right. Let's move to the uh, the other head injury you noted. Uh, and this was from an x-ray. You saw there was a bullet clearly inside of her. Uh, where was that bullet wound located? So the bullet wound was on the kind of the, the back side of the head, pretty, you know, fairly low and, again, a little bit to the right of the midline, so the back lower right side of the head. You noticed a, a defect, you said, in the, the white hood, is that right? Correct. Uh, this was the, kind of the fleece jacket she had on? Yes. Uh, does that suggest the hood was over her head when she was shot? It's certainly a, 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 a possibility. I mean, that, would make, that would make sense. Or in a, in, situated in such a way that it would, it would have to penetrate that hood and then into her skull, is that right? Yes. Um, again, that would make sense. I mean, could it, it's... You know, one of the other possibilities is this, you know, sometimes people have clothing that have random holes in it and, and whatnot, but it's certainly, again, the, the gray material certainly suggests that sometimes on, you know, on the bullet um, there can be, you know, soot and grease and stuff like that. So as it passes through clothing, it can, this can wipe off and be on the clothing. So that certainly made, you know, was... During the during the examination, our thought process was that this this a bullet was probably making this mark, and and that's why we were again looking carefully at the head to look to see if there was bullet wounds because this was the hooded part of the sweatshirt. All right, so there's clearly an entrance wound. You you describe that, uh, but because the bullet was in there, I'm assuming no exit wound. Correct. There was again there was an entrance wound, and then the the bullet stayed within the head. Um. What did you do to retrieve that bullet? So again, as um, I mentioned earlier in describing the autopsy, you know, one of the things that we do is the internal examination. Again, in, in addition to looking at the organs of the chest and the abdomen, we also look at the head. So again, we'll make a surgical incision to the scalp to be able to uh, manipulate that to be able to look at the, um, get as um, complete uh, look at the surface of the skull uh, and that's again where we can we can I could see the where the bullet had perforated the the back of the skull, um, and then we will uh, 
take off a portion of the skull to be able to look inside at the brain. Um, and we'll also remove the brain as part of the autopsy process to examine that and also look at the surfaces of the skull underneath the brain. Um, you're so you're able to document several of the injuries to the brain and the skull. And we'll get back to that, doctor. Thank you. Are you essentially following that wound path? Correct. So, again, we, I can, you know, as part of the external examination, I can look at the, the defect that's on the skin and, and document that. And then, again, as part of that internal examination, I'm, I'm able to essentially, through the examination, see which parts of the, the skull and the brain and, and the, the base of the skull where that bullet traveled through and, and essentially document its pathway. So give us a sense then of that uh, wound path. Where Correct. You... Yeah, it, sorry, oh. tell the jury where that wound path went. With this yeah, it, essentially it went from the back of the head to the front and then also from the right side to the left. So it was back to front and right to left. And where did the bullet end up? The bullet, uh, we, we recovered the, the main part of the, the bullet uh, from the, the fancy term is the oropharynx. So it's basically the, kind of the back of the throat, the, kind of where the, the nose and the mouth uh, part of the throat meet. And once you recovered that bullet, what did you do with it? And so we uh, retrieve it and uh, photograph it and then again package that as part of the, um, the evidence that, that we released, uh, again, under chain of custody to, to law enforcement for their examination of it. All right. Um, can you tell us anything about the distance that firearm was from her head when she was shot? Sure. So I guess... Um, I think the, the are you, can I, I guess, describe in general terms how we classify things first? And, Please. Okay. So most uh, forensic pathologists, when we have, um, again, one part of the, the examination and when there's a gunshot wound is we're going to, we want to document, again, what, where is an entrance, what's an entrance wound, is there an exit wound, recover the bullets, but we're also trying to determine what we call as the range of fire as best we can. And most forensic pathologists will, we kind of divide things into three categories. Um, contact, intermediate, and indeterminate. So when thinking about this, um, I, some people have lots of experience shooting um, with guns. Some people have never shot a gun. So I always try to explain this. And you know, we have to remember that more than just the bullet leaves the gun. So again, the uh, the gunpowder in the, the bullet is, uh, in, in that cartridge is ignited and it creates this combustion that um, causes this fire and all this gas forms that pushes the bullet out, out of the gun. So sometimes at the, coming out of the gun can be a little bit of the fire or flame from this um, reaction. There's a lot of gas that can come out of the, the end of the gun. Um, there's this combustion going on, so there's soot that's coming out. And not all of the gunpowder that's in the cartridge burns up. So there can be unburned gunpowder that comes out. So when we're looking at the skin um, around the wound, we're looking for, can we, can we see signs of these type of things? So a contact gunshot wound, um, essentially we're saying that the gun is essentially up against the skin or very close to it. If it's not touching it, it's very close to it. And we'll be looking for signs um, such as, you know, is there burning of the skin, you know, from that flame? Is there, sometimes um, you might actually see like a, a um, abrasion or, you know, kind of rubbing of the skin around the wound from the, from the muzzle of the gun. Sometimes you might see uh, tears in the skin from all that gas that goes in and, and can tear the skin up uh, a little bit. Um, or uh, again, all the soot that comes out, you might see really dense deposits of soot in, this, in, the, in the wound and the skin around there. So we'll be looking for those type of things. If we start to see that, we, start, we think, okay, the gun is right up very close to that. As we get, um, so that's contact. Um, when, when we classify, uh, when a French pathologist classifies a, a range of fire as intermediate, um, again, I mentioned that not all the gunpowder um, burns and so 
if the gun is, uh, if the muzzle is a little bit further away from the skin, maybe a few inches up to a couple of feet, uh, and that unburned gunpowder hits the skin, it'll leave a little small abrasion, a little small mark. So if we see signs of that, that gunpowder hitting the skin, we know that the gun's relatively close but not right up against the skin. And, and there's different ways, different tests that the ballistics people might do to try to get a more precise measurement. Is this 6 inches? Is this 12 inches? That sort of thing. But we know that it's, it's relatively close. If we don't see any of that information, there's no, you know, there's no searing of the skin, there's no soot, there's no muzzle abrasion, there's no, none of these gunpowder uh, abrasions. Uh, we, you know, I'll classify that as indeterminate. Because again, I, I can't say that it's contact, I can't say that it's intermediate, it's indeterminate. And it might be, there's, the reason why we call it indeterminate is there might be, you know, a couple of situations either Either the gun is far enough away from the person where, um, you know, the bullet's got, you know, the bullet's able to travel a long, quite a long ways, but the soot and the unburned gunpowder, they don't have a lot of mass, so they, they aren't able to travel very far once, once they hit the air. So it might be that, again, that this is a, that the gun is a, quite a distance away from the, the body, um, but the other possibility is that maybe the gun is relatively close, but there's something in between the gun and the skin that that is kind of absorbing the features that we look for in the skin. So, um, so again, we, we at the autopsy, I can only kind of look at what I have, you know, as far as the the features on the skin and, and the clothing that I have. And so, again, we typically will then call that indeterminate range. And that was, in this case, um, that gunshot wound, you know, I didn't see any of those features of the contact or intermediate, so I um, determined that this was an um, in indeterminate range of fire. You mentioned just now about uh, some things could be preventing soot or, or other particles from entering the skin. You talked about, obviously, the clothing. In this case, that could, could that play a part? Yes, uh, something like, you know, many objects could do something like that, clothing being potentially one of them. And then we talked about all the hair that was kind of in a, in a bun. Would that potentially do that yes. as well? Certainly, um, if there's a, a, a really dense and a lot of hair that can absorb some of the things that make it difficult or impossible to, to see <clears throat> um, these features on the skin. I asked you about the blunt force injury and whether she was alive at that point. What can you say about the gunshot wound? Again, the, the, the gunshot wound, again, she was alive. There was, again, bleed, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, uh, signs of bleeding around in the skin around the wound and um, bleeding, you know, the injuries that happened to the brain, bleeding around those as well. So, again, there, there was evidence that she had this vital reaction that the heart was beating at the time this injury occurred. Do we know how long the heart was beating after that gunshot wound? Again, similar to like with the uh, that the laceration, uh, these injuries were you know acute, but to be able to with any um, you know to be able to put a time frame on it is uh, you know, again it's you're you're not looking at days or anything like that, but it it's hard to kind of say if this was just seconds, minutes, or hours. All right, can you say? Which one occurred first, the gunshot wound or the blunt force injury? Uh, not definitively. Um, again, the there were multiple injuries um, as a result. Of, uh, multiple injuries to the you know as far as fractures to the skull, um, injuries to the brain, bleeding around the brain uh, that. We can see in both of these, um, both of these injury, I mean, certainly gunshot wounds um, to the head, pretty much invariably cause, you know, fractures and injuries to the brain, um, and blunt force injuries can cause fractures and injuries to the brain as well, but not necessarily as invariably as gunshot wounds. So there were multiple fractures to the the skull, um, and certainly for some of these fractures were 
as a result of the gunshot wound. So it was, um, again, because these are both acute injuries, uh, it really is impossible to say definitively based on the injuries that we had, which, which one would have come first. Is there anything you can say about how far apart these injuries occurred? Time, like in a time frame? In a time frame, right. No, um, again, because they, they both had, the, again, this appearance that, of being acute injuries, again, that happening within a relatively short time frame, again, seconds, minutes, hours, before the heart actually stopped beating. But they both, again, had the same relative appearance. So it's possible that, you know, that, again, to say which one happened first and how much time is in between them, it's it's really, you know, kind of impossible to, to say definitively. Uh, but, but you can say, I, I think you can say this, is you would expect that these happen within uh, its relative same time period because they're both acute, is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, would either one of these injuries have been fatal? The, definitely, like say, when we, the, the, the gunshot wound to the head um, and the, the pathway that, that it, it took, it, these are injuries that are essentially invariably fatal. Um, you know, the, the blunt force injury of the head, there can be, they, it certainly, yes, it certainly is possible to be fatal, but there also can be um, non-fatal blunt force injuries of the head as well. Um, and I think because they have the, the combination of them, it's hard to, it's hard, it, because of the gunshot wound, it's hard to definitively say exactly what injuries were, what injuries to the skull and the brain were caused from the blunt force injury. All right, because they're close together and, and as we talked about in the same time frame, is that right? Correct. Um, you mentioned a minute ago about skull fractures. Do you know if that was coming from the gunshot wound or the blunt force trauma or both? Um, again, like I said, pretty much when looking at a you know, gunshot wound like the one that, that the decedent had, pretty much invariably you'll have skull fractures from that. And she did have a skull fracture on, you know, kind of in the region where that that laceration was, there was a fracture of the skull underneath that area. That fracture lined up um, with where the bullet had pushed through or perforated the skull. So um, it's hard, you know, it, again, it's hard to def definitively say, you know, did that fracture radiate up from the bullet wound or did that, you know, fracture, was it caused by that blunt force injury and it was radiating downward and happened to just radiate to where that, the bullet ended up entering. So again, there's fractures in the area, but because with bullet wounds to the skull, we often get very complex and radiate, you know, multiple radiating and complex fractures. It's hard to definitively say whether one of these fractures was coming from the blunt force injury or from the, the bullet wound. Aside from the, the fracturing that you saw in the skull, was there also just uh, brain bleeding or brain, in, brain injury that you could see? Yes. Um, there was, again, the, the bullet had perforated a part of the brain, causing bleeding to the brain and around the brain. As well as for the blunt force trauma, did you see brain injury associated with that? Again, it's the, there, again, there's, there is a constellation of injuries to the brain. Um, so it's possible that part of those injuries are from the blunt force injury, but, you know, it's, to definitively say that you, you can have situations where you have a laceration without an underlying bleeding around the brain that, and that sort of thing. But there certainly were some of the injuries that we saw to the brain that could be a result of that, of that blunt force injury. 
based on your observations and your examination, did you determine a cause of death? Yes. What was that? So I determined the cause of death to be a gunshot wound uh, injury of the head and a blunt force injury of the head. We talked a little bit about decomposition. Uh, based on your observations, are you able to make a determination about the timing of the death? The, um, I guess just to, to back up, um, you know, we, I'd mentioned earlier that there's, you know, decomposition changes. As soon as a person dies, the body starts to decompose and certain changes happen. And, you know, the, the TV shows kind of make it seem like we can do this very accurately and very precisely. And that's um, not really the case. Uh, and we talk more in terms of, <clears throat> instead of like the precise time of death, we look at these findings and try to determine what might be the post-mortem interval or the most likely interval of from when the person died and when they were found. Um, and again, you know, the, the body typically goes through some typical changes um, that allow us to make some of these um, assessments. There are several factors that play um, that that can speed up. These, the way the rate that these changes um, happen, or can slow down these changes. So, um, the probably the the biggest factor that plays a role in this is the the temperature, the 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 environmental temperature that a person is in, the the person's body temperature, but essentially the the environment that the person is in. So, if a person is um, dies in a really hot environment, so summertime in Phoenix, when it's 100 plus degrees, they can very rapidly go through um, and get to a, a fairly advanced, you know, moderate to advanced state of decomposition relatively quickly versus a, a you know, a situation where um, if a person dies in a colder environment, again, we talked about earlier that we um, keep the, the, the people that are stored at our facility in a cooler to essentially as close as we can to stop the decomposition process. So if a person is in an environment, cool environment like that, it can really slow things down. So um, kind of a, a long-winded answer to your question, which I, now I can't remember <laughs> what the question was, but uh, it was... It, well, the question was... Um, <laughs> Can you say anything about the timing of, of death? It in this case, yeah. I, I, the she had pretty mild decomposition changes, but she was in an area in I mean in Coquino County. Uh, she was found in February, and the you know she's found in a time of the year where. Even though she's outside and there, it, the temperature can't get warm during the day. Mo the, essentially, most of the time that she is, uh, her body is exposed to the elements. It's in cool temperatures, so it really could be uh, she. Um, that postmortem interval for her could be quite broad um, because of the effects of this cool environment. So it's really hard to put. You know, it could be anything from you know a week or so to multiple weeks to a month is certainly well within a range um, uh, that you could have based on the, the type of envi environment that she was found. So we've heard testimony that uh, she disappeared uh, on the 18th of January, was found, as we've talked about, February 21st, so a little over a month. Would that fit within that parameter, with, within that time frame you discussed about if the temperatures that are cool enough and dry enough that it would be in that preserved state that you talked about? Yeah, so certainly, again, given that the, the environmental conditions she's in, that's not, that's not out of the realm of possibility. All right. May I approach the witness, Judge?
Yes. So 52 is the diagram, right? Correct. And 87 through 96 are those photos taken of evidence items from the examination as well as the body itself. So there, yeah, these are pictures from, you know, the, the body of the autopsy and then I think several of the clothing items uh, that were removed, and then 87 is a picture from the, the x-ray that was taken. Would you admit exhibit 52 and 87 through 96? Any objection? objection? No objection. Exhibits 52 and exhibits 87 through 96 are admitted. May I call this judge? You may. And just a warning to those watching some of these are autopsy photos of a body I just want to make sure everyone's aware of that let's start with 52 So again, this is the opening of the mouth, the nose. We're kind of looking at the, the face, the head from the side. So the back of the tongue, so this area right in here was where the, the bullet was recovered. It had kind of traveled through the back of the head and came to rest here. Correct. We had not confirmed um, her identity at that time. We, based on, there was some circumstantial uh, thought of who it was, but we were waiting to scientifically identify her to, before we made that so it's it part of essentially part of our procedure and in, in situations like this where we haven't definitively identified them to, to to list them as unidentified at the time that we're doing the examination yes So again, this is an, an x-ray, we're, we're kind of shooting it, what we call, this is what we call a lateral x-ray, so that we, the x-rays are passing through the body, you know, to capture a picture of the side of the head. Um, for those who are not familiar with x-rays, basically things that are dense are going to show up white, like the x-rays are not passing through them. So, you know, like the, the bones and that sort of thing, they have this dense uh, appearance to us. So things that are metal are going to show a pretty bright white. And we can see that here, this kind of irregular fragment there is the, the bullet that was recovered. And we can see that, again, you can see it kind of in the back of the mouth, throat area. Yep. Yeah, so you can see, again, some bullets, um, once they hit something hard, such as a skull, little pieces will break off as it travels through the body. So these smaller fragments are just little fragments that have kind of chipped off, broken off from the main bullet. Uh, this is a picture of the that hooded sweatshirt that she was wearing after we removed it um, from her body. Yep. So their point, this is kind of looking at the sweatshirt from the, the back. Yeah, the back. And this pointer is pointing at the, the small hole that we saw in the hood. And this is the, the dress she was wearing after, again, after we removed it. And 
And this is a kind of, again, close-up of that, the hood, the back of the hood, and again, the pointer. Uh, there's a, there were several of these small little, uh, like, burr type of things on there, just kind of grass burrs from, you know, she was laying in these cinders and whatnot. But you can see this right here that's being pointed at is that small defect with the little gray outline. So right here uh, in the center is that small defect. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah, my recollection, yeah, there, there was not a lot of obvious blood to the clothing or to the outer surfaces of her hair. Yeah, that that certainly could be part of it. And yeah, this is again a uh, photograph from the autopsy where the decedent she is lying face down. So this is the back of her head, um, and this would be the back right side here. Yeah, the would point out uh, again what your yeah what your exact. Again, you can get uh, again after a person dies and the heart's no longer beating, you can you know blood is just going to kind of settle with gravity. Um, and you can have, you know, again, if a person is lying on their back, most of their blood is just going to settle to their, their back. Um, if they're lying on the front, most of it's going to settle to the front of their body. Um, you know, you can get some localized areas where um, there can be some pooling of blood, just uh, kind of focalized, what we call liver mortis is the, the fancy term for the pooling of blood. And then also with just with decomposition, you can get a, what, a little bit of what's called um, marbling or discoloration with, as the, the bacteria that's normally in the body starts to move throughout the body. Um, you know, as far as the, the mark on the neck, she did have um, that sweatshirt was kind of tightly pressed against her neck and how she was kind of lying on the ground. So that is part of part of that could be due to that. So again, this is a kind of a closer up photo of the back of her head. Um, so this is the back kind of midline back of her head and just to the right, we see this circular defect there in the skin. That's the, the bullet wound. Uh, this is a picture again, that um, main bullet fragment that we saw in the x-ray in the oropharynx in the back of the, the throat. This is it as it's recovered and then um, again we photograph it before packaging it up to be turned over as evidence. And the, the bullet wound is here. I believe that the laceration, that blunt force injury is right in, in this area. Yeah, you can just barely make it up. That's kind of the, the edge of it. So again, this is a picture of the back of the head and now you can see a, a better you can see that laceration to the scalp, um, the blunt force injury um, more defined right here, and the, the bullet wound would be right in this area.
break now? Okay. We're going to take a break. Uh, we're going to take our break now. So we're going to be in recess 15 minutes. So folks, remember the admonition. Do not talk to anyone about the case. Do not let anyone talk to you about it. Keep an open mind. Please do not formulate any opinions about the case. We stand in recess 15 minutes. Council, anything further before we take our recess? No. All right, thank you. Stand in recess. 15 minutes. You can step down if you want. <laughs> so I'm thinking this is a more comfortable chair than the benches out there. All right, we've got water for you. 